Great. Well, it feels like Christmas was a long time ago now. Anyone else? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? That, that we look forward to it, we get to it, it, it happens, and it feels like a distant memory. And we get to the new year, and we can often feel like, right, we, what do we do again? What's normality look like again? What are some of the things that we actually need to get back into? Uh, and for us at the Kenner House, it's getting back into football. Uh, and I don't mean the stuff that I watch, that never ceases. Uh, I mean, we went taking Naomi to football on a Saturday. And uh, that's become back to our routine again. The mighty Ashton Pumas, you've heard of them, absolutely. You've probably got the, the, the best of DVD at home and you watch their clips, uh, absolutely. And uh, I, I take Naomi and they play in Cheadle uh, e each week. And uh, I don't know about you, when I go on certain journeys, I can often go on autopilot. Do you ever do this when you do a journey so many times you go on autopilot? But when I go on the M56, I got an autopilot towards Ellesmere Port. So yesterday, we might not quite have gone to Cheadle straight away. Um, we might, might have gone the long way round. And it was um, after I'd missed the Cheadle uh, turn off that I, I thought, where am I going? Um, and uh, I had to apologize to Naomi, we were a little bit late. If, I often get distracted. Uh, there are some of you who absolutely identify with, with that. Yes, you're the distracted type. <laughs> I do often. Um, I can forget where I'm going. Maybe it's my personality type. I don't know. But I think that's also what we can be like as Christians. We can easily get distracted about some of the things that we're called to do. I... Uh, we need to be intentional. And I often use January to take stock of where I am with the Lord and um, use it as a chance to be intentional in my time with Jesus. What has last year been like? What's been the fruit of last year? What does the Lord want me to focus on this year? And it often um, it's to do with spending more time with him. And I'm reading a wonderful book at the moment um, on the resolutions of Jonathan Edwards. Uh, who's the, the New England um, pastor from the 18th century. And he, when he was 17, made a load of resolutions. And uh, one uh, author has taken them and written different things about them. And I'm working my way through that, absolutely loving it. Uh, I'm also reading Bobby Firmino's autobiography. Um, I'm not quite as getting as much out for spiritual reasons for that one as I am uh, for this. But January is a great time to think about what God wants for us in the year ahead. At Holy Trinity, we've often used January for that reason. Where is he leading us as a church? What is he saying to us? And we usually think about vision, about prayer, about community, about giving. In other words, how do we be better disciples this year and be intentional for the king and for the kingdom? Because unless we keep hearing this stuff, unless we keep stepping into it, it's very easy to end up in Ellesmere Port rather than Cheadle and get distracted on the way. Now, we launched a vision in 2020, and if you're new to the church, forgive me if you're not aware of this, uh, we launched a vision, a five-year vision in 2020, where we felt the Lord calling us to, and we've been revisiting that each year, seeing some of the things that we've been focusing on and prioritizing. In the middle of it, of course, we had a pandemic, and there are some things that we've started, there are some things that we're working through, there are some things that maybe we've not quite got to as we'd hoped. And this is the last year now of the vision. Hasn't time flown? This is the last year of a five-year vision. And we spent last year, 2023, thinking about the second part of our vision. Because we're thinking, overall, live and share the good news of Jesus. And 2023 was all about, well, how do we share the good news of Jesus? What does that look like? We uh, decided that we were going to be intentional about mission and our focus and spent the first term looking at Mark's gospel. How did Jesus do the stuff of the kingdom? What did he talk about? How did he do it? And then we spent some time thinking about how did the early church do this? We looked at 1 Thessalonians. Once they'd received the gospel, what impact did that have on them as a church and their priorities? And then finally, we looked at, well, what does that mean for us? And we got a bit practical. What is the gospel? How do we think about invitation? What does sharing a testimony look like? How do we have a heart for our town? And I hope the year was helpful as we were thinking about the good news. We had a mission weekend in October, the Wheel of Staley Bridge weekend, I know many of us were part of. We launched one of the biggest alpha courses that we've done on the back of it. We had churches together in the park and we planted a church. It was a fun year, 2023. And God has been good to us. We've grown as a church. And over the past few months, I've been praying about this year and feel led by the Holy Spirit to focus just on two things, which is prayer and community. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do other bits and pieces. We don't do other things. Of course we will. 
But I love the idea of what does it look like to be church and to pray as church, to meet together and to seek the Lord in prayer. Now, you know me, I like a good play on words. Um, and I like things to be memorable. Can anyone remember what last year's kind of phrase that we hung it all on was? Blessed to be a blessing. We talked about it so much that it reminded ourselves this was our focus and our priority and our direction for the year. Well, I was thinking, well, if we're thinking about community and about prayer, there's something about being with one another and there's something about being with the Lord. So I wondered about this for a phrase, together with God. That's it for this year. Really simple, really easy to get our heads around, being together and being with the Lord. And interestingly, this is a theme that runs right the way through the scriptures. God calling a people to himself so he can be with them, together with God. And to kick this off, we're going to be looking at the book of Exodus and a a series that we're going to be calling Love God. Now, as a church, we exist to love God, grow community and serve Staley Bridge. So this time we're thinking about love God. Next time, guess what the sermon series is going to be called? Grow Community. Can anyone guess what the last one's going to be called? Serve Staley Bridge. Absolutely reminding ourselves of what we are about. So this is the first talk right at the start of the series. And can I just ask you, are you up for a slightly longer talk today as part of an introduction to all of this? Is anyone not up for that? I love the fact the safety in numbers there. No one's going to be that person who goes, well, I don't really want to, but it would be a bit awkward. if It, um, it was a risky question, that really, wasn't it? Um, so Exodus, we're going to be looking at, do keep that in front of you. And this is a wonderful book that's hopefully going to teach us a lot about God's heart uh, and the call on our lives. And I imagine most of us will be here this morning with some level of understanding or knowledge of the book Um, We've probably come across the stories like the burning bush, which we'll look at today, the plagues, the escape, the parting of the sea, the commandments. And all of that, by the way, takes place in simply the first half of the book. Exodus is 40 chapters, and by chapter 20, we receive the Ten Commandments. All of that happens then. And the second half of the book, 20 chapters, is all about God making his dwelling with us. The heart of Exodus... It's actually not the escape. The heart of Exodus is God being with his people. That's the heart of of, of the book that we're going to be looking at. So as we're thinking about this series in the context of loving God, let's have that in mind. However you come uh, to church this morning, whatever your view of God is, let me just say this. God is not distant or far away. He is close and he always has been. The God that seeks to draw near to us and invite us to draw near to him. So, uh, just as I start, this made me laugh. If Moses had a smartphone, that's probably what he'd be doing just about as he was about to split the sea. I really lo- love that. About to split the sea, send, right, put the phone away, off we go. That's if he had Instagram. I was chatting, actually, with Michael Hughes, thinking if John Wesley had had a smartphone, he would have been unbearable. And there are certain people in history that might have been, actually, that never would have left us alone. But that just made me laugh. Uh, So we're going to be looking at Exodus. This is the second book of the Old Testament. It forms uh, part of the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, known really as the law books uh, written by Moses. And if you were to flick to Exodus, not to do this, but Exodus 17, 24, 34, and Deuteronomy 31, you'll see accounts of Moses describing, being described as writing part of the law. That's actually in there. And he may well have written all five books, but it is worth saying that during um, the Pentateuch, there is a verse that describes Moses as the most humble man who ever lived. There is also a verse that describes his death. So we might have questions over whether he actually wrote all of the Pentateuch. We may also have questions to do with some of the content of these books. Because we don't know all of the details. We don't know the exact route that the Israelites took to Egypt. We don't know the exact route. We don't know exactly where the sea was parted and the Israelites went through. We don't know that part of body of water exactly. We don't really know where Mount Sinai is. And we don't know exactly who the Pharaoh was when the escape from Egypt happened, when the Exodus was. But you know, we know that this is God's word. That we can have confidence in God's word. That we can believe and trust it and allow it to speak to us today. It's his story and it's also ours. 
So we're going to have a, a little look at this today, and I hope and pray it, it deepens our knowledge and understanding both of, of the God of the Bible, but that we will see how Jesus is, we see glimpses of Jesus through the Old Testament, and how he ultimately will fulfill what we see in the Exodus. So you've got chapter 3 in front of you. Uh, I'm going to whiz us through chapters 1 and 2. told you it's going to be a little bit longer. And even though we've only done 17 verses of chapter 3, we're actually going to go up to chapter, chapter 4, verse 17. Mike, lock the doors. Take a breath. Here we go. Now, so we're looking at, at chapter 1. Um, and this is meant to be read as an ongoing story. The story of God's people here is meant to be starting with creation, fall, Um, expulsion from the garden, the call of Abraham, the family into Egypt, and the story is meant to end when God's people come out of Egypt and stand at the border of Canaan before they go into the promised land. We're meant to see that as one big narrative and big story of God's people throughout generations. And the reason we know this is the first word of Exodus in the English isn't correct. The first word of Exodus in English should say the. Is that right? Come on, gang, give me something. I'm going to be talking for two hours, I mean, um, (laughs) half an hour. But that's what it should read in the English. In the Hebrew, the first word is and. And. And the reason I make such a difference is we're meant to see this as a continuation from Genesis. As soon as Genesis finishes, and these are the names of the people. This is a continuation of the story. And chapter 1 shows us the blessing and the favor that God's people had. And the increase in the number was a sign of this. They settled in Egypt and grew from a family into a people. But the new king is threatened by them, puts them in slavery. And the more they are oppressed, the more they grow in number. So he does two horrific things. He, he seeks after killing the baby boys and he throws them into the Nile. And that's the context of the birth of Moses in chapter 2. Now, at the beginning of chapter 2, we see through the birth of a child, everything will change for God's people. Does anyone think that sounds like someone else from the New Testament? I'll give you a clue. It begins with J and ends in Jesus. So that, that's the first glimpse we see of Jesus here. A birth of a baby is going to change the whole world. Now, all we know at this point is he's a Levite, because that's who his father is. The Levites become the priestly people who look after the temple. And the reason that's important is Moses is going to be the greatest priest. Because he is going to stand on the mountain of God, receive the law, and be the mediator between God and the people. That's to come. So Moses is born. He's set in a basket and placed in the Nile to avoid being found by the, by the Egyptians and killed. He's discovered by Pharaoh's daughter who names him, takes him to the palace. A Hebrew nurses him, which is his own mother. And straight away, we see God's hand on the events. This could end up anywhere, but God has it in control. You set the baby on the Nile, he's going to be found. He's going to be taken in, and he's going to be nursed by his own mother. The Lord is at work here. Verse 11, we read, the child grew up, and whether he considers himself an Israelite or not, he most certainly has compassion on the Israelites. He cannot stand by to see one of his people being mistreated, and he ends up killing the Egyptian. This, I imagine, has always made many of us have questions about what's going on here. And I'm not going to go too much into that today, but do grab me afterwards over a brew if you want to talk about that a bit more. But I just want to say one thing. Look at who God calls and uses for his purposes. Look at Moses' past and what he's done, and it doesn't exclude him from being used by the king for the kingdom. It's never too late to be used by the Lord. And that's such an important point at the start of a new year. Uh, Erwin uh, Lutzer reminds us, and he says this, I love this quote, there's more grace in God's heart than sin in your past. And right at the outset, that didn't exclude Moses from God's call, and it doesn't exclude us, whatever may have been. So Pharaoh finds out what Moses has done, seeks to kill him, and Moses flees and sets up a life in Midian. He marries Zipporah. Is that not just one of the best names in the Bible? And if you're anything like me, don't you wish you knew a Zipporah so you could regularly say, I'm just going to go and meet Zippy? (laughs) Just me. Sorry, just me. So we come to our reading today, and we've heard 17 verses, but we're actually going to go up to chapter 4, verse 17. But um, let's have a look at the beginning of chapter 3. And the backdrop to chapter 3 are the final verses of the previous chapter in chapter 2. God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. 
God never leaves a situation. He's concerned. He's moved deeply. And this is his solution to what's about to take place. So Moses is a shepherd. Anyone see any significance to someone in the New Testament? Cool. Um, There's lots of parallels with Jesus all the way through. You know what? We might start something with, if you see it, put your hand up. No, okay. Now, there are similarities here with the encounter Moses is going to have with uh, the encounter he has with God with the Ten Commandments. Both occasions, there's something about approaching God but not getting too close. There's something that involves fire. And interestingly, it's also the same mountain. The mountain that he meets God in for the burning bush is the same mountain where he receives the law. So the burning bush, who has at least heard of this or read this or done this in Sunday school? Familiar to most of us? Now, when the Bible was written, we didn't have chapter headings in. I think this is one of the strangest chapter headings in the whole of the Bible, because we're told there's a bush and it doesn't burn. And whoever put this together says, right, the burning bush. (laughs) I'm not convinced they really got to the heart of the story. Anyway, never mind. It's a bush that doesn't burn. And what I love here, right at the beginning of this story, is the fact that God initiates the encounter. Do you notice that? God initiates the the encounter. Moses sees the bush, he goes over, it's not burning up, and the voice of the Lord comes and speaks his name. And right at the beginning, we get this wonderful truth that God is relational, that God knows your name. He knows everything about you. He doesn't just say, bloke with the staff and the sheep, could you come over? Moses. He calls his name. Moses. He's personal and relational. He then says, take off your shoes. One of the things that I think we've missed a little bit in the church in the West is the holiness of God at times. God is so holy, so, so holy, so good. And here we see, take off your shoes, don't get too close. He's a consuming fire. He is so holy. But we also get God revealing who he is. I think this is so significant because this isn't a new God. This is the God who created the heavens and the world, who who is coming before him revealing who he is. And he reveals himself as the, as the God that Moses has heard about. And there are three wow things that we're just going to look at. And wow number one is, this is God. Just picture yourself, and I know it sounds an obvious thing, picture that you're with the sheep, you're going about your day, you're daydreaming, and God turns up. Hey, he's a bit bonkers, isn't he? And he turns up in that way, and he calls your name. And he's the God you know about, you've heard about, he's come to you. The one who made everything. The one who walked with Adam in the the garden, the one who called Abraham, he's here in front of you. Wow, number one, surely. Well, wow, number two is, he says, you know all those people that you had a bit of a heart for? I've got a bigger heart, and I'm going to do something about it. Amazing. God shows up. He's going to do something. Brilliant. Wow, number two. And then he says, and you're going to be involved in it. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. This is where Moses reacts like most of us would. I'm not so sure you've got the right person here. We see two callings. We'll come to his response in a moment. But we see two callings, actually, here. There's the call of Moses in verse 10 to be the person to go back to Egypt and to make this happen, to bring people out of slavery into freedom so they can worship God. The call on Moses. But there's a second call, which is a bit more subtle, which is the call on God's people to be the people of God, meeting with God. There's a call to worship. There's a call on them to be with God. You will worship God on this mountain, it says in verse 12. Call on Moses, call on God's people. So imagine you're Moses. What's your reaction? Flipping heck, I should have gone that way with the sheep, not that way. Now, could you imagine? You've met God and he demands something of you. And the way that you left Egypt, you're told you've got to return. Such a challenge. I wonder what your reaction would be. But friends, we too have a response to God's call because all of us here today have been called by God. As the psalmist writes, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. God is calling to us to be with him, to follow him, to be his people. What's our reaction to the calling? And often we can think, well, I didn't see a burning bush. I didn't audibly hear the voice of the Lord. Maybe God isn't actually calling me. He's calling you through his word, through his son. And whenever God calls, that is the miracle of the supernatural God breaking into our world, 
calling you and me by name to himself. God calls Moses and he calls us. So then we get the response. So we're going to have a, a, a look at Moses' response. And um, it's something interesting, isn't it? I wonder what your response would be. I often hold up some heroes of the, the, the faith and go, gosh, I wish I was like them. I wish I was like that. I wish I'd seen what they'd seen. I wish I'd done the things that they'd done. And I realize when I read this account, I'm a bit more like Moses than I realize. Because the first thing he does is, whoa, I'm not sure you got the right guy. Who am I? Who am I, Lord? What an honest response from Moses. Who am I? Verses 11 and 12. And there are two ways of reading this. We could either read it to be, um, I couldn't possibly do this. I'm not worthy enough. Either true humility or false humility. Or the other way we could, we could read it is, maybe he's getting clarification on what's been asked of him. God said he would go, he's asked me to go. Maybe Moses is a detail person rather than a big picture person. He's just trying to figure out you know, how that works. But I actually think it really is something to do with fear. How could I possibly do this? Little old me. You've probably got the wrong person here. It's too big. It's too scary. But God is gracious. Do you notice what God says? I will be with you. In other words, you'll be doing it, but really it'll be me doing it alongside you. God is so gracious when he calls us. I don't know about you. I can be tempted to agree with this. If you've got the right person, I'm way out of my depth here. I'm not sure it's me you're actually calling to this. Have you ever had those thoughts? You don't need me. Actually, all of those people, they're the ones who've got it sorted. You could do it with them, not with me. Or maybe even, do you know what? If I don't turn up, I won't even be missed. Have you ever had that one? They're all lies. Because God is calling you and calling me. Not because he needs us, but because he wants us. We're called by Jesus. Maybe this is a year to think about how God is calling us to follow him and what that looks like. So the first thing, who am I? And the next thing, you know, I can't help but read this with a Scouse accent. Who are you? Who am I? Who are you? Because what he says straight after, who might I be, is, well, actually, who, who are you? You know, if I'm asked who sent me, what do I say? And I think this might be, on, on the one hand, quite a reasonable thing to say. If I'm asked, what do I say? But it's not really reasonable because what he's doing is projecting his doubts on the Israelites. Moses is probably thinking, you know, what if they test me? I don't know what to do. At verse 14, we get the direct response. Probably one of the most famous verses in all of the Bible. I am who I am. That's what you say. I am sent you. We could translate it, I will be who I will be. I will create what I create. It's a way of saying God can only be defined by himself. He's so otherly, he's so amazing, he's so wonderful. And the shorthand of this in Hebrew became YHWH, from which we get Yahweh. That's how it was trans, that's where it comes from. God is so gracious, he tells him what to say. And we can be tempted to believe this as well. What do I say about my faith when people ask me? What do I say? Well, it's something to do with God's name. And we know God has revealed himself in Jesus. When people ask, what do you do on a Sunday? I go to church because of Jesus. What do you do with your time? Well, actually, I serve Jesus because I believe he is who he says he is. Who do we follow? Jesus, who is good, who is kind, and who is with us. God is so gracious. So who, who, who am I? Who are you? Who are you? Um, so I'm going to keep doing that. Um, and then we get in chapter 4, if you were to move on chapter 4 at uh, one time, if you wanted to flick, flick over to that, we get the, the, the great response of the what if question. Do you ever have that where you, you catastrophize? Uh, is that the right word? Something like that. Um, and you think, what if everything goes wrong? And you think about things that would never happen. Well, Moses is doing a bit here. What if they just don't believe me? And what if they don't listen to me? Now, God has appeared to him. God has said go, and God has said he'll be with him. And he's still going, hang on a second, what if? Because he's not convinced. It seems like he's less concerned about Pharaoh and more concerned here about the Israelites. What if they don't believe me? And God says, well, hold up your staff. And it becomes a snake. And it becomes a staff again. And it's a, it's a funny verse, really. You might think, well, why a snake? Well, the, the snake was a symbol of the royalty and the power and the politics of um, the nation of Egypt. And it's a way of saying God is over that. He has authority over that. Put your hand in your cloak and it will be leprous when you, when you come out. And when you put it in again, it will be healed. 
a way of saying there is authority over sickness and over disease. God is gracious and says, actually, if they don't believe you, here are the signs and wonders. What about us? What are our excuses at times for not wanting to follow Jesus? Where follow where God leads. Often it comes down to, what will it demand of me? And what will others think? I wonder if this year is a year to take those to the Lord and say, well, where is he calling us to be and to serve in being intentional? God is so gracious, he gives us what we need. Fourthly, he says, well, what if I mess up? He's gone, who am I? Who are you? What if, but this one, what if I mess up? Do you ever have that that moment where you go, it's pointless getting involved because I'll just make a mess of it? Now, that's a thing in life that many of us have, certainly when it comes to the church. Moses has no confidence in speaking. Uh, Some think he may have had a stutter, but the Hebrew literally translates as this. I am heavy of mouth and heavy of tongue. It might be, actually, he's just forgotten how to speak Egyptian. It might be he's been a shepherd so long, he doesn't know how to relate to people in the royal courts anymore. He feels completely away from where he was. And this is my favorite response of the Lord in all of these, because there's a play on the words here that we we can often miss. Moses says this, I am slow of speech and tongue. And Yahweh responds, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him his sight or makes him blind? Is it not I? Moses, it's a play on words from the Hebrew. Moses feels his I, I do not feel enough. But God says, my I is enough. I am the one who makes the way. Moses is I, God's I. And Moses is trying to get out of this. He doesn't realize that God cares more than he does. And I do think this fear of of messing things up is what can often cripple us as a church. I won't do it because I'll get it wrong. Or I got it wrong once, I'll never do it again. Or that failure haunts me. Getting it wrong, sinning, letting God down, is not what disqualifies us. It's what should help us run into his arms. We will mess up. We will get it wrong. We will let others down. We will get let God down. We will sin. But Jesus has dealt with all of this on the cross, paying for our mistakes. So that's four. Resistance. Right. Ready for Egypt. There's one more, though. I love this one. Please send someone else. Could you not just relate to that? Who am I? Who are you? What if I could mess up and please send someone else? This is the one, if you go to um, uh, verse 13 of chapter 4, it's the first time we see God's anger here. And uh, let me just explain what I think what's going on, because after all of the objections that are met by God, all of them, Moses still doesn't want to go. And this one's quite hard to address because it's not based on anything tangible, It's just Moses' reluctance, plain and simply, to go. And he goes, no, I don't want to do that. It's an anger, though, with love in it. I was reading this this week, and and when I was centered on on this verse, I just had an image of the parent and child. You know, when the parent gets really frustrated with the child, and it doesn't matter what they say, they still won't come around to your way of thinking, they're still being resistant, they're still being reluctant, and it can be so frustrating but what often is, is, is being manifest here is the fear of the child for change or for, for difference. And what's manifest here is the fear that Moses has. And what does any parent do when, you fear, when you're afraid? You make sure you're not alone. I love the, the heart of God here that says, okay, your brother will go with you. You'll do this together. He will speak for you. You won't be alone. This is the start of God's plan to bring his people out of slavery into freedom, to be a people, a nation with their God, to worship him and to live for him. And the call on the people of God and on us today in this is to be God's people together with God. As followers of Jesus, we can often do many things and get distracted in many ways. But really, it's important to be intentional just about one or two things at a time. Can I invite you to focus on prayer and community this year? Dwight Moody said this, give me a man who says, this one thing I do and not these 50 things I dabble in. Could we be intentional about seeking after God together? Being a community of saints who pray together, who meet together. 
more on how we do that next week and how that will, uh, will respond to that. Because I realize there isn't a one size fits all for us. But how could we be intentional in a way that works for us this year? So I'd love to ask you to partner with us in this. Pray with us for this focus in 2024. We have their prayer and praise night coming up, the 25th. I'd love you to join us so we seek the Lord together. Later in the year, there's going to be a few things uh, coming up, and I'm just going to highlight four uh, very quick things to mention. Um, in February, we're going to be doing a, a Lent devotion together, just a way of, again, connecting as a church and praying together. And more about that will be coming up. We've got Holy Week and obviously all the Easter fun coming up at the end of March. In May, we have a church weekend at home. And from Friday night to Sunday morning, we're going to be spending time together in a variety of different ways. Uh, and Paul and Becky Harcourt, who used to lead New Wine, are going to come and join us uh, for the weekend and spend time with us. Uh, it'd just be a great thing to pop in your diary to, as we be church together. Uh, and then we've got a Pentecost in the park. The Lord is doing something in unity with the local churches at the moment, which is really exciting. And uh, this will be coming up in May. And uh, if I hadn't let you know, I'm on sabbatical from June to August. That means I will disappear for three months, but I hope to reappear uh, after that. Uh, but more about that as, as we go on, but just uh, to flag that up as well. Uh, I told you it was going to be a long one, but, but this year, can I just say, is not a year to run at, at um, an incredibly fast pace. The last couple of years have. We've come out of a, a pandemic. We've needed to get back to how we do things. Last year, we were thinking about connecting with our town. This year is how do we prioritize community and prayer? How do we get good rhythms in? What does that look like for us? Moses was a reluctant leader, but was used by God for great things. And it might be we are reluctant this morning in playing our part. But can I just say, Moses was pointing to one who came after him, who wasn't reluctant, who took it on himself and made a way so that we can rest and rely and lean on him. That when Jesus came, he fulfilled all of the call of God. And he is the strength that we can draw on today to be the people God is calling us to be. Friends, if you want to join with what the Lord is calling us to, can I invite you to stand as we pray together and the band leads us back into worship. Let's stand, let's pray, and let's invite God to come and minister to us.